My name is Servos. Um, I will be uh, hosting uh, this wonderful day today. We've been working uh, for quite a long time to uh, get you all here and talk about building uh, hubs to uh, build a more sustainable, more livable cities. So how can we have a different use of public transport, of, of transport in general, to create uh, cities that are accessible to us all? We have a, a one and a half day of, I believe, very interesting and nice sessions here in Amsterdam in Pakhuis, where we are right now, and hopefully we'll, um, we'll have a wonderful dialogue with each other and we really go into depth about the topic of uh, building different kinds of cities through uh, a different approach to transport system, such as the hubs. Today is, um, in a sense, the closing session of the Interac program um, e-hubs, where different cities from all over Europe looked at the uh, a, a new approach to transport through hubs. I will talk about that a little bit later. Uh, I would ask the uh, elder person, the new elder person from the city of Amsterdam to join me at stage to welcome you officially to our cities. Melanie van der Gras, please uh, uh, join us and a big round of applause for her, please. Thank you for uh, joining us this morning. Um, yeah, you're going to tell us about why you think Amsterdam uh, finds it such an important topic. So please go ahead. Thank you. And good afternoon. Well, actually, it says good afternoon, but it's good morning still. Hello, everybody. Um, and a very warm welcome to our guests from abroad. It's the final event of eHubs, Mobility Hubs for Sustainable and Livable Cities. Today and tomorrow, all lessons and results of the project will be presented. I hope you are ex as excited as I am. Today, our city is sometimes called the world capital of car independence or a bicycle paradise. I like that. And there is definitely some truth to it. More than half of all trips in the central areas of our city are done by bike, and more than a third in the rest of the city. When you have some time to discover the city, I hope you will notice that Amsterdam is committed to being a relaxed, livable city with sufficient space to walk or ride a bicycle, green areas, and clean air. Well, clean air, relatively, I would say. We're not entirely there yet, but we're getting there. It hasn't always been like that. Amsterdam used to be a city dominated by cars, and for decades, mobility and city planning focused mostly on accessibility, and how to get as many people as possible in the least amount of time from one place to the other. These days, we also have other priorities. Of course, it's nice to travel as fast as you can, but the car isn't the answer anymore for everything, because it would lead us to one traffic jam in the whole city anyway. Traffic in the city has to be safe also and relatively pleasant for all residents and visitors. Air quality has to improve. We want less emissions. And in general, we want mobility to be less dominant in the way we design our neighborhoods. For example, we want less parked cars, so there is more space to play, to walk, to meet other people. We still need motorized vehicles, preferably emission-free, of course. For example, for persons with disabilities or for logistics. Mobility is still very important, let's say that. But we make different choices when we structure or restructure certain areas. One of the main ambitions we have as a city is to be climate neutral by 2030. I believe eHubs can play an important role in making that happen. With eHubs, six partner cities from five countries implemented a shared mobility concept, inspiring and encouraging many other cities to do the same. eHubs offers people an alternative to the privately owned car by providing easy access to several mobility options, improving the accessibility of the city and making better use of space in an increasingly densifying city. And what I really liked about the project are the different approaches of implementation. 
In Amsterdam, the eHub project is part of the Amsterdam Smart Mobility Program that develops different mobility concepts and strategies. Our eHub pilots were created together with residents, many of whom are here. And I will even tegen jullie zeggen ook, iedereen Amsterdammers, hartstikke fijn dat jullie er ook zijn. Heel erg welkom natuurlijk ook, want jullie zijn uiteindelijk ongelooflijk belangrijk geweest in dit project. Zonder deelnemers geen project. Sorry about that. But it's really important that we have participants in this city that were actually wanting and willing to go for this experiment. So without them, there would not be a project at all. So thank you. We think it's important that an e-hub meets the needs of the neighborhood. Participating residents get to vote for their most preferred means of transport. Each e-hub can therefore differ in size, types of transport and associated service. What also makes this project special is that it is evidence-based. Four knowledge institutions with its own focus and expertise are helping us to decide where and how to build effective and widely supported e-hubs. You can learn more about the research results later today. Ladies and gentlemen, e-hubs gives us a window to the future of mobility. I really like this sentence when I read it. So let's just repeat it. Ladies and gentlemen, e-hubs gives us a window to the future of mobility. And although new mobility opportunities and concepts also create new challenges, it is an exciting future. Again and again, the question will be, how can we use mobility to our advantage? And most importantly, how can we keep the city accessible, safe and pleasant for all? I'm anxious to hear your ideas. Enjoy the conference and everything else our city has to offer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Melly Lee van der Hoes, uh, newly um, appointed alderman for transport and uh, traffic and air quality, but also green spaces in the city. Uh, thank you for joining us. Unfortunately, you have to run because there are many things to organize here in the city. Yeah, I'm trying to save public transport, yeah, and which is see, quite I'm important. Much in favor of public transport, yeah. so please do. Uh, uh, a big round of applause. Luckily, uh, uh, we found uh, uh, two people from the City Council of Amsterdam who are more than happy to join us today. Zeger Ernsting and Elise Moeskops. Please join us at the table. There will be, uh, uh, of course, more than enough substitution uh, <laughs> for the continuing uh, discussion for later today. Um, today will be recorded at many moments throughout the day. So this venue will be recorded all day. The other two venues on the fifth floor will be recorded. So if you're not able to join one of the sessions, uh, you can always watch them back at home later with all your uh, time you want to. Uh, let's go to the next session. Um, as I said, at the table we have Zeger Ernsting and Elise Moeskops from the City of Amsterdam. Um, you both are a City Council member. Uh, Elise, we were just elected at the election last, uh, uh, last March. And uh, Zeger, you've been uh, a member of the Council for quite some time now, but you're both quite active when it comes to uh, public space and, and, and transport in a broader sense of the word. Also here at the table we have uh, Karen van Kluizen, and you are the Secretary General of uh, POLIS. And POLIS is a European network when it comes to uh, cities in Europe, but especially focused on transport. Thank you for joining us. And of course, also Tracy Rollins. And you're an executive member of the Manchester uh, City Council when it comes to environment. Thank you for all for being here. Uh, for the people in the audience, if you have questions, if you want to participate, raise your hands. Of course, there are a lot of topics to go through, but I'll try to go to you as often as possible, so don't hesitate to participate in the dialogue. The only thing we have to make sure is that because it is recorded, your voices will be on the microphone. So I'll go to you with the microphone and you can join us. Um, to start with you, uh, Tracy, welcome uh, here in Amsterdam and thank you for, for being here. Um, how did you listen to the speech from the other person? 
Yeah, so thank you. It's my first time in Amsterdam, so it's quite exciting to be here. Um, I was very interested, and I could relate to some of the, the opening speech there in terms of making our cities more accessible. Manchester is also a very, very dense city. Um, in particular, our city centre is lots of developments, and it's very dense. And unfortunately, the car is king, so I could identify with that need to change behaviour. And I think, for me, the eHubs project has been really exciting to almost do that try before you buy and re-educate people into travelling differently. So I could very much identify with lots of things that have already been raised this morning. Thank you. Uh, Karen, how did you listen to the uh, speech from the other person? Well, it confirmed what I already know, and that's uh, that Amsterdam is one of the leading cities in Europe when it comes to sustainable urban mobility and innovation, which is at the heart of what we do at Polis. Amsterdam's a member, Manchester's a member, Arnhem, Nijmegen, Leuven, they're all parts of the network, and, and they're really leading the way here in Amsterdam in terms of um, the measures they're implementing. And, and it always comes with the risk if you embrace innovation, if you're amongst the first to introduce it at least. And Amsterdam has definitely been amongst uh, those pioneers when we look at what's been done in the field of air quality, electrification, uh, but also data, for example, which uh, is a skill that is important to eHubs, but also a skill that we very much still need to develop within our cities. The digital gap between the public and the private sector is quite big. And, and with Ger Baron here and his team in, in, in um, Amsterdam, they've been doing a lot uh, on that. And it will be important to have that data-driven decision-making at the heart of our policies as well, uh, to justify also why we take drastic decisions such as the reallocation of, of space um, that was being talked about. Thank you. Elisa, of course, it's your elder person. Um, so you're quite happy, of course, about what you said, at least. I hope you are. Um, why is it so important for, uh, for you that the, we have a different approach to public space here in the city? Well, I, I mean, I, I did like what she said, and I also like uh, a lot what the people across the table said, uh, and I like the fact that Amsterdam is leading, but it's also something that makes me anxious, because we want to stay in that position. Mm -hmm. And not only that, I think it's still going way too slow. So maybe I'm a little bit more impatient than my yeah. elder person. Um, but yeah, and maybe that's also my role as a council member, but our city is growing and we're seeing more and more problems emerging from that growth, from that density, um, uh, and everything is related to busyness, um, air pollution, all those things. So I think I just want to go a bit faster. Yeah. More and faster. So you're... Well, you want to go faster, <laughs> but what would the future then of, of transport and mobility look like in a city like Amsterdam or Manchester, in that, for that sense? So what are the, the key part components of, of, of this system for the future be like? Well, I think, I think the answer to that is not that simple. I mean, if I can dream, I would have a city uh, divided in uh, different parts where we could do um, logistics in concession, which is not allowed by the European Union, and rightfully so. But, mm -hmm. you know, you would you'd bundle all those parcels, all those transport movements, uh, by being very efficient in your transport. The thing is, that is not... It is a dream, but I always think that it's good to have sort of that end goal in sight, although you know it's maybe not obtainable, mm -hmm. but try to think in that direction. How can we get as many people, as many parcels, as many uh, transport movements joined into one van, if we really have to, and preferably in an electric bike with a nice little thing in the front? Yeah. Zeger, how can we make sure that the, this, this network of the future works for us all? So how can we bring everybody along and make sure that this, this is not just something for the rich or something for people who can afford nice, shiny Teslas or BMWs? That's the question, I guess. I think it starts with um, a, a different approach of how you view public space and its functions. Uh, and public space is not only a place uh, where you go from A to B and uh, want to go as fast as possible. But public space and the public realm is the, is the environment you live in. And, and in cities, people choose to live in small houses or in small apartments, uh, really dense, really together. Um, and the public space and the public realm should provide the people with the best possible uh, surrounding to live in. Uh, safe, healthy. Um, and if you uh, approach it with values like that, th then you come, I think, to a concept of maybe communal ownership or, in, or a public space that people care about. Yeah. Uh, and if you have uh, a public space that people don't care about because it's only asphalt uh, for private cars, 
you have a city that nobody cares about. Um, so if you have an approach like that, I think uh, you uh, need to arrive to some sort of communal ownership. And I think this is the big challenge maybe also for the e-hubs and the private companies that participate in it. Uh, what is, uh, how is the ownership organized? How is the public sphere incorporated uh, uh, into uh, making questions about what is the common good? Yeah. Karen, you were Karen, you were talking about uh, the data component. Mm -hmm. Could you tell a bit more about why data is then an important, well, in solving all this, the human aspect? But when I go onto the street, I'm not thinking about data. I'm just trying to get somewhere. So how does this come into it? Well, getting more data, and, and there's a lot of data out there, will help. Uh, political leaders also to justify the choices they are making because mm -hmm. they will be more evidence-based or at least they will be able to um, justify those choices by showing that data. And when we talk about e-hubs in particular, then we're talking about bringing um, mobility services together which are inherently digital in nature because, well, you know, you have the, the e-scooters, you have the e-bikes shared or the cars and they're all connected. So in everything some goes cases. through an app. Yeah, exactly. So it's a way to better understand what is happening with these modes within your ecosystem, what kind of model shift is being generated, but it's also a way um, for um, enforcing and monitoring those modes, for example, through the data that you that you collect. And we see that if we want to make sure that these new services, which are uh, private sector driven, have a contribution to the ecosystem and the public policy goals that we uh, envisage as public authorities, if we want to make sure that they uh, have that positive contribution, we need to regulate them, meaning we need to mitigate negative externalities and maximize opportunities. And data is one way to help us do that because we'll be able to understand what is exactly happening. But we did a survey last year uh, with Polis amongst both the public and the private sector and we saw there was a huge digital divide still between the public and the private sector in terms of data intelligence. So we need to work on building those skills and acquiring those skills also within our cities. And then the other reason why it's important is because we are talking about multimodality and intermodality here. And if we mm -hmm. want to make that easier for people, we also have to make sure that we do not only physically integrate these modes through the hubs, for example, but also digitally through mobility as a service where they all nicely come together in, an, in a digital environment too. And, and, and how could then, why is the approach of the eHub project different than, for example, just building nicer uh, streets or perhaps less parking spaces? and more for sharing cars. So what, what is so specific about this project that is so needed for this change? I think if we want to compete with a private car and with the attraction of mono-modality, mm -hmm. we'll have to make sure that all sustainable modes that are out there, all the alternatives join forces and come together and together offer an alternative to that private car. And that means we need to do everything we can to facilitate seamlessness, intermodality and multimodality. And e-hubs will be instrumental in making that happen, not just having the big interchanges mm -hmm and stations, but also neighborhood-based mobility hubs where uh, people can pick up an alternative to that private car. So that will be instrumental in, in competing with what still seems to be a very attractive mode. And we have to understand that being multimodal is a burden. It's so much easier to be monomodal. If that's a bike, perfectly fine. But if it's a car, it's not fine. So we really need all those modes to come together and fight that other mode. To make it as easy as possible. Yeah. Uh, Tracy, how is it, um, how's the situation in Manchester? Is it difficult to talk about these kind of topics? Because here in Amsterdam we talk about, uh, we, <laughs> we try to make sure that the sidewalks are broad enough so people with a pram or with, uh, who are, um, have to go by, by wheelchair are able to go through. And this is a hard fight to make sure that people don't park their bike anywhere. And at the same time, it's a hard fight to get people to, even in Amsterdam, to change modes. But how is it in Manchester? Again, it's, it's very challenging. Um, we're quite an old Victorian city. I wish sometimes I was designing a new city. It would be so much easier with a blank sheet, wouldn't it? But we have to work with what we've got. So as you've just explained, our pavements are often very narrow. Sometimes cars even park half on the pavements because the roads are so narrow. So um, if you have a pram or a wheelchair or even myself, I need extra space because I don't see well, it can be really difficult. So it's a struggle and it's difficult, but we have to 
be bold as political leaders, I think, to make those policy decisions that say we cannot carry on like this. We want to be carbon neutral by 2038, which I thought was ambitious, but hey, you're ahead of us there. So I'll be watching and learning for that. But things are moving and, you know, we cannot do nothing. We have to do something. So it is difficult. And I think the conversations are only just happening it's a positive, I would say, of the pandemic in that we all appreciated our outdoors space more and our walking. So I think for us, it's about turning some of that data into that longer term benefit for our health and well-being. So if I'm spending more money now on reallocating road space, what will that buy me back in the future in terms of our healthcare systems, etc.? And it's framing it in a in a situation and a conversation that is relevant to people. So I cannot afford the shiny Tesla or whatever, but actually, have I thought about those short journeys that I now do in the car? Could I walk and then jump on the rented bike if I haven't got a bike of my own? It's about having those conversations to change those perceptions. And the way we've used the eHub project has been at that neighbourhood base, so smaller, a few bikes, e-cargo bikes, a couple of um, car clubs so that you can share a car. But it's about changing that idea of status and that you've made it when you can afford a car. My 16-year-old is like, when I'm 17, I'm going to save up, I'll buy a car. Because to him, that was a coming-of-age thing. But actually, I want my kids to be saying, can I have a new bike? So it's changing those perceptions. It's working with families so that this is just and it's social justice as well as all the other environmental and transport issues that we need to do to save the planet because climate change is real. The evidence and the data tells us that now we can't deny it. Mm -hmm. So it is changing how we frame the data so that we're talking in languages and words that people understand and it's relatable, our fuel prices, et cetera. What are we doing about changing our energy renewables? You know. Powering a bike is much more easier and cheaper than powering cars. So we just need to change those conversations into frameworks that people can relate to. Yeah, but how can we, and also looking at you, but how can we move from, of course, everybody agrees that it's much nicer if there are less cars in the street and if it's easier to walk through the street. But at the same time, it's quite hard to convince people to give up the spot yeah. or to convince people to give up their behavior. So how, how do you work with that? Well, I would say it's the carrot and the stick. Eh? So uh, you have to uh, uh, you have to uh, uh, convince people, uh, maybe on a moral level even, but also uh, you have to regulate. Eh? You have to regulate parking. Uh, you have to regulate ownership of cars. You have to regulate usage of cars. And cars are not um, very equitable. Eh? Uh, I mean, gasoline is very expensive. Owning a car is very expensive. And a lot of uh, the poorest people can't even afford a car, not even if you subsidize it, uh, for instance. So um, you have to uh, strive to an inclusive transport and mobility system. Uh, and um, uh, one of the main aspects now in Amsterdam is our need for adding extra housing, because housing is a big problem. So you have to densify the city. Uh, and I think uh, the communal agreement is that um, if you densify the city and build extra housing, you cannot solve your mobility questions with cars. I mean, every, everyone will get stuck at some point. So um, there's a, not only a, a wish for um, uh, another model shift, but there's a necessity for it. Yeah, Lisa? Yeah, I also think that we need, and I think here we've tried to be, uh, have a certain level of fearlessness. There is some trial and error. I mean, we tried the scattered bikes here in Amsterdam. It was a bit of a disaster, to be honest. But that's based on the city that we already are, with a lot of bikes already here. Uh, so it was adding to a problem that was already there, instead of reducing it, which we hoped. And data can definitely help us there if we see what happens in other cities. The problem is, though, that well, every city is a bit different. The way that's laid out, if it's Victorian or medieval or... Uh, the way that the density of the people is combined, and also the culture of mobility. Mm -hmm. uh, having a car as a status symbol or just having that sense of independence by... I remember the first time I could drive my bike by myself to my school, and I felt really grown up because it was my bike that was my independence. So there's so many factors weighing in, uh, but the thing is we shouldn't be afraid to give something a bit of a go. And I think with the eHub project as well, I really like the fact that we're also trying it with a, uh, a street that's just a commercial street. So it's just to entrepreneurs using an eHub. See how that works. See what happens. We need the data to live and learn and grow our city. So we need to be able to fail as well and to learn and experiment. 
Hopefully we won't. I mean, yeah. that's always the hope. We, we yeah. hope that we have that, that, that brilliant idea that will be perfect from the go. Yeah. Uh, and the scattered bikes uh, example, I think, is a good one because it's really difficult to roll something back once you've allowed it as a city. It's way more difficult than just say no from the beginning. But we need to ha have that risk in our policy making because we need to take the risk to save the world. Yeah. And if you, well, I, I would like to add, and I completely agree, uh, I would like to add that if you provide um, alternative modalities uh, like e-hubs, the benefits of it should be instant clear. And so if you, buy, if you build an e-hub, you shouldn't buy, build it on the pavement. You should build it on a private parking spot, of course. Uh, and maybe uh, uh, remove some other parking spots and make them green. And so it should be visible, the benefits of, of uh, adding something or adding an extra uh, mobility surface uh, the, the benefits of that should be crystal clear. Tracy? Yeah, absolutely. I think it is about how we recognise how people travel, how we choose to go to places of destination. So the end-to-end -end journey has to work, doesn't it? If I need to travel a long way to pick up that bike, for example, it becomes less economical. We're very time poor, so we're all, as you said before, we're all really busy and that creates half the problems. We need to look at many more policies, I think, outside of transport as well. So are our employers flexible enough? Do we make it easy for our, our workforce to be able to travel differently? Where are our schools? Are they placed on the right roads for public transport, etc.? Are other methods of shared transport, public transport, are they affordable? Is it easy? Do I have to wait 15 minutes for the next bus or do I just go to the stop knowing another bus will come, a bit like London Transport, for example? So we have to look at things in the round and make sure that the alternatives that we are urging people that they must use work for them. Mm -hmm. And that's why dialogue with residents is always so important, so that we're not designing something on a sheet of paper and then when we put it into practice, it doesn't work for everyday life, which is really key. And how can we make sure that, um, because we have a lot of wonderful uh, research results from the different universities connected to the EOPS project today, and there, the whole idea of trying to negotiate new ideas or trying to, to, to be innovative is in, ingrained in our system, but in the political system, it's mostly not. So how can we make sure that cities are open for that? How can we change? I'm, I'm hearing from both of you and from you. So in Manchester, it should, and, and Amsterdam, it should be going well. But how can we make sure that the, the mindset of politicians is that, well, I can try something without a guarantee 100% that this will go good, go well? I, I don't think it's that easy. And I don't think that we are going well in that respect. I mean, I think we're trying. Yeah. Um, but there is a politically... The whole political system is has an element of it's ingrained not to want to fail um, because that looks bad and you don't want to look bad and you want your voter to see that you had that brilliant idea that works and you thought about it really well and everything like that. So it's difficult. Um, but I think the urgency uh, that we have and that we're all feeling right now is shifting that a bit. Um, and I think just saying it out loud at things like this saying, you know what? We are there, we're just gonna try and we're gonna fail, but we're trying it for the common good. And saying that out loud as many times as we can mm -hmm. and instilling that sense of urgency with everybody and showing what we're doing, I think that's the only answer that we have. Maybe it's not the best answer, but it's the only answer we have. Last. Yeah, well, I think uh, the, the mobility revolution of the 70s in Amsterdam was also a bottom-up movement, uh, uh, combined with a, with a top-down uh, movement, uh, and they clicked. Uh, they, they found each other in a different approach uh, to our public space and to our mobility system. So I think it's uh, very important for lasting change to organize uh, and make use and talk to bottom-up movements that want this. These are large international networks of uh, city builders and planners that want to build green, livable, people-oriented cities. And if you combine uh, the top-down uh, and the politi political level with the bottom-up movement, I think you can make lasting change. Tracy, of oh, Karen. No, no, go ahead. no, I think it's an ongoing challenge on the political level to, to try to reconcile what the individual citizens want with what the city as a whole needs, and those are not necessarily, uh, on the contrary, uh, they're mostly um, not aligned, and, and that's, of course, always risky for politicians. But I think the example of Paris that has been radically transforming its urban space 
also shows that it can get you re-elected. Mm -hmm. and, and just to quote the, um, the Secretary of State of Urban Planning of the city of Brussels, which is a very car-centric city, but where a lot has been going on over the past years as well, is he said sometimes you have to make people happy against their own will, which means sometimes you just have to push through. And then by showing how a city can be different, um, you win the hearts and minds of people. Tracy. Uh, I, I agree. It isn't easy, but I didn't come into politics to have an mm. easy life. I knew it would be <laughs> difficult, but I think most of us come into this because we want to make a difference. And it is being, it's exposing yourself to challenge, I think, but actually being able to also actively listen to people and saying, OK, we tried it over here, that didn't quite work, but what did we learn? And every mistake isn't a failure, but it's a learning experience, I think, and it's how we can take that and move it along. And, you know, in terms of this sort of technology and things, everything is changing. So we have some issues with our older population perhaps not being as au fait with the phone and using the apps, so they feel excluded. So what can we do in our education systems to teach older people to be more comfortable with the phone so that they can, you know, go and hire a, a bike or whatever so that they're not excluded. It's wrapped up into so many things, it just doesn't work on its own. It is a whole systemic change that does take a long time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we're at the end of our time for this session, but luckily it will go on much more during the day today and much opportunities for also for you to connect with each other and to meet each other at different levels throughout this building today. Um, there are networking spaces on the expo. The first floor there will be a very interesting uh, um, exposition of different uh, suppliers of uh, shared mobility who will showcase their products or their opportunities and their solutions. Also here in uh, this this venue will have many discussions and on the fifth floor also two rooms with many discussion and especially in the Eizel, Karen, you will be there with the lessons learned from the pilot cities. In the first round we'll talk with uh, about Amsterdam, Leuven and Kempton and in the second round we talk about Dreux, Nijmegen and Manchester about all the solutions coming through. Of course there are also possibilities from the connected universities. Um, Big round of applause for the speakers here today. Uh, uh, Zeger Ernsting, uh, city councillor for the city of Amsterdam for GroenLinks. And Elise Moeskops, a uh, city councillor for the city of Amsterdam also, but then for D66. And uh, of course also Crazy Rawlings, executive committee member environment of the Manchester City Council. And Karen van Kluysen, secretary general at Polis. Um, will, big round of applause please. Yeah. We'll go to a short musical inter, um, intermission and I am looking for my notes because it is quite nice that she's here, but then I have to introduce her properly. It is Talua and I can't find your, the note, but please join us on stage. You'll be uh, uh, entertaining us tomorrow morning with your, uh, uh, with your music. Talua Rose, big round of applause please. Thank you well. Yeah. Yeah. Hi everyone. Um, hope you're all having a nice morning. We are gonna uh, play a song of ours for you called Water. way no more Flowing downstream towards the shore River takes everything where she flows Let her softness seep inside your soul Sway no more. Flowing downstream. 
came towards the shore. River takes everything where she flows. Let her softness seep inside your soul. Let her go on with courage. Let her go through all damage. I have been so afraid of getting hurt. my heart up from love Now I'm ready to try I don't know what I will find Afraid of things I might Let her go Let her go On with courage Show your love Through all damage It's Leo Rouse. Thank you so much.
Um, thank you. Yeah, we're ready for the next round, and we're going to talk about research results from Newcastle University, from the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences, from the Technical University of Delft, and the Antwerp University. Please welcome on stage Gonzalo Correa from TU Delft, Rijn-Jan Renes from uh, the um, Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences, Thierry uh, uh, van Nelslander, uh, he is from Antwerp University, and Neil Thorpe, of course, from Newcastle University. Welcome on stage. Um, yeah, for the people in the uh, in the venue, again, if you have questions, please participate and let us know. Uh, con join us in the discussion. Uh, just raise your hand and I'll join you for um, for your questions. Thank you here on stage. For the two of you, I have new water glasses because I couldn't reach the walls. So this one is filled for you. And that one is filled for you. So underneath there is water. Um, to start with uh, you, Gonzalo, um, of course, you've been working on this project for quite a while. How did you listen to the politicians and to Karen van Klausen from Polis talking about the need for your project? Yeah, I couldn't agree more with what we heard uh, this morning already. Uh, I really like that uh, Karen mentioned, for example, the need for very good data. Uh, this is uh, very, very important. She also mentioned mass, mobility as a service. And this can only work uh, if you have very good data about what's happening in the city in real time, that you can manage um, multimodal uh, mobility, which is really the challenge, because we are competing with a car, which is door to door, very comfortable. Uh, and we are asking people to do uh, multimodal chains where they have to transfer, right? So this is a big challenge. This really requires, uh, you know, real time optimization of these, of these different modes uh, working together. And at the same time, the data is very important for us as transport modelers to estimate this relationship between supply and demand. We have in, in urban areas very complex networks mm -hmm. uh, and we need to model this uh, interaction between supply and demand on the different transport modes in a very detailed way so that we can design solutions, that we can forecast what happens if you provide a new solution. And we are very good in, in terms of modeling how uh, you know, cars move in traffic and also traditional public transport, but with new modes, uh, you know, these on-demand modes, we know very little at this point. So we, it's very difficult for us to, to supply these solutions if we don't know more. So, yeah, you're happy with, uh, with the approach at least. We'll continue on the, on the an importance of data later. I want to, uh, to look at you, Thierry. Uh, welcome here in Amsterdam. Thank you. Um, how did you listen to, to, the, to the discussion here on the table in the, in the previous panel? Yes, yeah. Well, um, I must say, interesting discussion and also interesting to hear that uh, even from a policy point of view, from a city point of view, people are so advanced, I would say, because we see often that governments are lagging a bit behind. Of course, these are best practices or these are organizations like Polis very much involved, very much to the front. That's a very mm -hmm. good thing, of course. I'm also happy to hear that the issues that they have mentioned are actually the same ones as the ones that we as scientists experienced. Yeah. And uh, uh, Gonzalo has already mentioned the importance of data, of course. I would even like to extend that a bit into information in general. I mean, if we want to judge on how successful certain innovation initiatives with respect to mobility also are, it's important to have access to good information. Not only data to make the pilots as such succeed or the project as such succeed, but also the information to judge about it. How do the authorities feel about the success or unsuccessfulness of an initiative? How do the users feel? How do other stakeholders feel? And I think that information is really crucial. Unfortunately, very often that's lacking. And we've seen that, I've been involved at university now in Antwerp for 24 years in this kind of research. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I must say, even though there is often more data available somewhere out there with operators, often private operators, it's not accessible to the ones doing research about it, to us, for instance, but also to other researchers, to other governments even. So we see, I would say, a regress rather than a progress even on that side very often. Yeah? Despite the fact that there is more data available somewhere and technically a lot is possible, to get access to it and to be able to do something with it also scientifically is very often hard. And that's something that I would like to stress here. And, and why is that? Is there too little political drive behind it or is, is it harder to get science squared? Well, I think, first of all, um, we've seen over the past years, past decades, that a lot of activities have, well, I would say, 
been privatized to some mm -hmm. extent, I mean, gotten into the hands of private operators. And logically, I mean, these operators have as a main interest, let's say, to make a profit, which is, is a good thing. I mean, that's what companies should do, of course. That also means they protect on what they have, and what they have also is data. Mm. It's not only strategic information, but also so it's data. Diff it's difficult. And of course, we're talking about different levels of data. Sure. Like I, like a, uh, like, uh, like a no <laughs> not a scientist. I'm, when I'm talking about data, I'm thinking of my data plan or, mm -hmm. or, or data centers where a lot of data is stored. But when you're talking about data, you're also talking about data analysis and research results and these kind of things, how you can compare those things, right? That's true, but even the inputs to do the research are yeah. lacking. I mean, there are companies and the operators, all operators have data, and the bigger operators, of course, have even much more data. I mean, Google knows yeah. perfectly where we are and probably that we are all together on this table here today through our smartphones, but that doesn't mean that we have access to it or that the ones doing research or analysis have access to that. A while back, I read a quite interesting article about how TikTok is um, far more accurate in predicting your sexual orientation <laughs> long before you do. So, um, interesting. Yeah, there's an um, discussion. Uh, Rijn-Jan uh, Rennes yeah. from the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. Voilà. Um, of course, you know the topic uh, from Manchester and Amsterdam very well, also living here in the city. How did you listen to, 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 to the discussion just, just then? Yeah, I'm, I'm basically also... Uh, yeah, what I basically do is that I, that, I also, that I always look at it from a behavioral perspective. So yeah. when, we, when we have this discussion about data, uh, then I think it's, of course, we need data, but we also need a lot of data about uh, the motivation of people. What is it that people think? Because it's not only about the cars yeah. or the transport, it's about the people who make their, these choices. And what we are basically lacking is what is it that people do and why is it that they, they, they make these Choices, and that was also one of the, our aims in this project to find more about more about these motivations and capabilities and opportunities of the people who make everyday choices. So why? So the choices. Why would people make uh, choose for the bike? Yeah, or for, for because we still have a my car society basically, mm -hmm. and we what we've learned is that people really love their cars. So we can make all these kinds of nice uh, hubs with e cars, but. People who like their own cars say, okay, that's nice, but why should I use these e-cars? I have my own car. So, and then you can even have a rebound effect that those people who tend to use their bike or walk, they start using e-bikes. That's from a more climate change perspective, not a very popular option that we want to have. So, so we really have to look at why are we doing this? And that's because we want a shift from an, a non-sustainable option to a sustainable option. Mm -hmm. So then we have to look at car owners instead of only looking at e-hubs. Yeah, thank you. So I see Neil <laughs> nodding here, so that's good. <laughs> Neil. Yeah, um, I think a lot of what we heard early on in the morning was very, very relevant. I think in the last two years, we have seen a very rapid acceleration in the growth of electric vehicle for private uh, ownership. Um, and I think the danger is that we electrify the private vehicle fleet and that will help solve climate change but it won't help solve uh, traffic congestion. So there's a danger that we just maintain the status quo of what we're doing at the moment uh, and we have sustainable traffic jams. I think to reduce the number of vehicles on the road you've got to look at some kind of shared mobility that is very different from what uh, we've been doing for the last 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and then when you start affecting people's behaviour, you're then into the political environment that we heard towards the end of the previous conversation. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, mobility becomes a very hot topic in the run-up to an election, but then it tends to fade away. Uh, and it may be we need some kind of political agreement that we're going to take mobility out of the political arena because it's so important for climate change that we cannot go on having this flip-flop between political parties that we have to say, right, we have to have cross-party agreement mm -hmm. on the way forward. So it's a scientific approach on a broader societal issue that we yeah. have to... I, I think the technology there, it, it, the solution will be behavioural. 
Yeah. And this morning we talked about, of course, the also the social need and the need for have space for climate adaptiveness, for rainproof, heat stress, all these topics, but also paying children. Uh, of course, the speech from the elder, elder person really focused on that. But if we go further, so if you look at the data, you say that if we don't do it correctly, we have like sustainable traffic jams. Yeah. Is that also something you found, Gonzalo? Yeah, that's, that's one of the risks. I mean, I'm leading a lab on, on electric vehicles as well and automated vehicles. So technology is, is here to solve some of the problems. But regarding the usage of, of, of private cars, it's not just about the, the, the energy. It's not just about the emissions, it's the space that the vehicles are occupying, not just moving, but also uh, parking, right? This is very costly. To build parking, for example, mm. underground parking is very costly. So there's an opportunity cost there. You could be using that money for other purposes, right? So the usage of private car is not just about the emissions, although, of course, this is uh, the global warming is an emergency that we have. So if we can uh, transfer, uh, so if you can switch this fleet to more sustainable vehicles, of course, this is going to be positive. This is happening already, mm. and the Netherlands is a leading country in, uh, in changing the, the fleet of vehicles, but it's not just uh, that, right? It's transport demand management, mm. it's the stick and carrot that was already mentioned mm. in, the, in the first uh, uh, panel, which I, I think it's really a very important expression, because you cannot just act with a stick, uh, you cannot just act with a carrot. You have to have a, a bundle of measures and policies all together, right? So you cannot provide hubs and then just allow people to park everywhere in the city. So th that's not going to work. But at the same time, you can also not uh, impose things as some kind of a, a top-down revolution that doesn't allow people to adapt because still you want the people to be using the, the city. And there's a lot of people also coming out of the city. We should not ignore that because Amsterdam attracts a lot of people from a hinterland, right? It's not just yeah. the, the Amsterdamians, it's also the people who are living in other places that need to access the city. So that's that's very important to think, the, the multimodality that we have already discussed. So then how do you approach this? Because we have we talked about the different roles. Of course, the more politi political role, there is a chance or a danger perhaps that people say you're activist, the more activistic roles, which is also good role, but you are a scientist. So how do you approach this from a scientific role and how do you make sure that all the scientific, well, preconditions are being met and at the same time you want to move forward? So perhaps you, Cherry? Yeah. Well, the answer I would give to that is we look at this in a neutral way and that's also a role as scientists, I think. Neutral in my case, I'm an economist, a transport economist, is we look at this from an economics point of view, yeah. including the welfare point. And if you do that, you cover all these interests, basically. And from that point, I would also like to add to Neil's point. I mean, it's not just about making cars greener, of course, or even just making transportation greener. It's also about other issues. I mean, Neil mentioned people are then standing into sustainable congestion. Congestion is one of these other issues, indeed. It's also about accidents. If you keep on having cars, you keep on having lots of accidents, most likely. You keep on having noise problems. You keep on creating wear and tear to infrastructure, which is costing a huge amount of money to society. So it's a package that needs to be there. Not just a one-shot solution that will tackle one of these problems and maybe create many other problems next to that, but an integrated solution, that's what we need. And that's what we try to offer also with the research we are doing, I think, all of us as scientists yeah. in that community, looking at this from a neutral point of view and just calculating also the costs and benefits from a societal point of view. And if you do that, clearly the projects which have a positive benefit, a net benefit, will emerge. And those are the ones that hopefully will then be picked up by policymakers also. And if we look at the different projects you did from the, from the four universities connected to this project, Neil, so what was the University of Newcastle focused on? I think what we focused on was um, who might, what type of people might be willing to use an e-hub, um, looking at the kind of trip they were making, and then if those trips were made via an e-hub, what impact that might have uh, on the environment. Um, and I think we all around the table probably agree that the, the problem we face is that the people who are currently more willing to use an e-hub are those who are already walking and cycling. Unfortunately, uh, the larger group are the, the current car users. Mm -hmm. um, they tend to be less environmentally aware. 
Um, they feel that there are barriers to using shared mobility in terms of the cost and the availability. Um, and so I think we've got to look beyond the numbers that we may have an e-hub uh, that's very, very popular, but we have to look below the numbers and work out who are the people that are using them. Yeah. Uh, because you may get commercially a very viable e-hub, that people are using it, but you're not getting the environmental benefit because it's not the people giving up their cars that are using them. So, for example, if you have an e-hub with lots of electric scooters, or STAPs, as they're called in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. which are basically illegal here, most people don't know that, but that's the reason why you can't rent them on the street. Um, but the danger with that is that people use these STAPs, uh, scooters, as an uh, alternative to walking instead of an alternative to the car. Yeah. And your research was, what happens there? Yeah, well, the research there, I think, moves on to how can you mobilise the larger group, the target yeah. group, if you like, who are the car users, how can we mobilise them through nudging, through other kinds of incentives to give up the car? Yeah. Otherwise, e-hub will become popular with people who are already travelling sustainably, um, and we don't get the environmental oh. benefit, which is why the whole objective of the e-hub. And Gonzalo, what was the uh, contribution of uh, the Technical University of Delft? Well, basically we do a lot of modeling, mathematical modeling. But basically we collect data and then we estimate models of how people behave and how they make their choices. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the unique aspects of this project is that it looks at hubs. So we, we have a lot of shared mobility, free-floating shared mobility. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases this causes problems like bicycles everywhere. We don't want bicycles just, you know, in the middle of the sidewalk. So the hub is an opportunity. To, put, to physically aggregate uh, different modes. And one of the things that we wanted to look at was um, if people are willing to uh, use another mode if the one that they originally wanted is not available. And this is a fact, there's a percentage of people, if they don't find a bicycle, they can use a car in one day. And it's already there because it's in the same physical point. Yeah. So this allows you to organize mobility and, and make it more reliable, more robust. Because that's one of the problems with shared mobility is the uncertainty. Uh, where is my vehicle going to be available uh, tomorrow? Uh, maybe it's not going to be available and then I have a problem, right? So you need to introduce more reliability and we see that by providing different modes in the same point, you add this reliability. I, th I think we need more, uh, more studies, but we already have some good clues that this is indeed an advantage. Thank you, yeah, and so you try to, 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 to bring it into picture of what it would mean if you built this system. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and we need pilots for that. So we can do this in a theoretical perspective and describe what the hub would be. Mm -hmm. But it's better if you really have the hub yeah. and then you put people using the thing, right? And, and that's the type of research that we are trying to do more and more, this kind of quadruple helix where we have everybody together, right? the companies, the, the research, the, the people and the government, everybody together to really provide solutions that are realistic. Yeah. Uh, Jay, what was the research from the University of Antwerp? Yeah. Well, we mainly looked into business models and trying to see if we talk about e-hubs. E-hubs can take many shapes, many forms. Which ones are working, which models are working, and which ones apparently are working less, and why are they working less? Yeah. To make it a bit more clear, in terms of business models, you can look at e-hub solutions which limit themselves to one or even uh, a limited set of uh, transport modes that are connected to that. But you've also e-hubs with uh, connecting many uh, types of modes. You've got e-hubs in small cities, in big cities, for instance. E-hubs in areas which are very much used for... Uh, job functions, working functions, whereas in other cities it's also applied in areas where people are living to a high extent. So you've got a lot of parameters that you can play with and that you can influence. And that will determine also whether a certain eHub solution, a certain eHub business model, will be working or, or not. So colleague Elnert, also as part of his PhD, has been looking a lot into this. Which types of models can we have, yeah, theoretically? Which ones do exist in practice? And which ones do seem to work in practice and why are they working? And what can we learn from this to extrapolate to other cities? For instance, um, some business models which are applied in bigger cities seem to work very well there. 
but there's no guarantee that those will also work into smaller cities. And that's important to know because otherwise those smaller cities might hearing a lot this buzzword and might also want to implement this, whereas in their case it might just be a waste of money if they follow a certain path, a certain type of business model. So it's better of course to steer them in the right direction, one that is useful for them and also for their citizens and for the users of their mobility solutions. And that's what we try to do with uh, our part of the research. Thank you. And um, Ranjan, yeah. what did you do at the University of uh, Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences? Of course, you already talked about trying to predict, predict behavior, yeah. but you're also researching on changing behavior. Yeah, that was basically the focus. We tried to find out what it is that car owners, maybe at least what they needed to try at least this sharing one, just one time. So we looked, okay, what is it that will maybe motivate them? What kind of capability do they need? What, what kind of opportunity should we hand them that at least to try once? And then you already see how difficult it is that, that even if they are, they are motivated and if they see that there's this opportunity in this, this, this car they have, this ingrained habit, this, uh, this routine for years and years and years. And so just to give them even one time opportunity, then, then even then you see that it's, it's really needed that not only to put these pull factors inside these e-hubs, but also to look at the push factors that push them away from this ingrained habit. That's, yeah. that's, that's what we try to study and to find out. We even gave them an, an app that, that showed them the amount of carbon dioxide they used when using these cars and then every day they get this kind of fitbit mm -hmm. message this is what you use and if you change your habit and it's it's less damaging to the climate and then even then you see the people okay this is interesting but i'm still going to use my car and and if you combine all these research uh, from the the the, the well trying to bring into a sharper picture what people do right now, how people make choices, how you can convince them to make different choices, and how you can build sharing uh, schemes in such a way that they're feasible for smaller cities. So a sharing scheme for cars would work in Amsterdam or Manchester. But I'm, I can imagine, I've never been to Kempton, unfortunately, but in Kempton probably it would be more difficult. So that was the research you did and the combination of those. How much did you work together? Um, did you collaborate a lot? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My uh, group collaborated a lot, so <laughs> they have met these yeah. people. Well, there's a lot of data collection, and that for sure we have collaborated on, on designing the best surveys, which is really tricky uh, to design. Surveys, like t lots yeah. of tick boxes and asking people what to do, yeah. <laughs> so those surveys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah these well, kinds of surveys. Yeah, what, what they were doing before and what they are doing after uh, the hubs and, and what are indeed the triggers uh, to switch to these uh, solutions, looking at, of course, prices, but travel times and availability of vehicles. So this is where we collaborated. I would say that Newcastle and, and uh, to Delft collaborated really a lot because of the, of the data analysis, but also, of course, with the psychology because uh, you, know, you know more about the, the behavior than, than we do. But I think that's, that's what unites us here, yeah. is to understand how people make their choices and what are these triggers to change their, their behavior, which is still you know, the million dollar question. How do you change the behavior, especially of the car users? Because one of the results that we had was that indeed lots of public transport users would like to use the hub. But okay, that's not sustainable, <laughs> right? You don't want to take people from trams to, um, to shared mobility. Uh, so that's the challenge. How do you bring them from the, from the private cars? We have a question from the audience. And another question, let's just go there. You want to respond to that? No, definitely not. <laughs> okay, then I'll go to the, um, to the audience, as I promised. First question here. I'll hold on to the microphone. Yes, thank you. Hi. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm saying this correctly, but I uh, lately uh, uh, I, I read that the uh, Dutch government uh, decided to make it possible for municipalities to offer discount on parking spaces that are reserved for um, uh, sustainable uh, modes of transport, uh, like uh, e-cars. Would you say that this also contributes to the uh, new term, which I really like, sustainable congestion? Or would you say that this, um, uh, yeah, this is the right direction we will move to? So to, to, to try to translate what you mean is that you, um, so the city government, city governments have to write now here in the Netherlands, to give a discount to uh, um, all sharing modes when they're renting car parking spaces, only cars. 
Okay, and would this country, is it a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> uh, who wants to respond to that? I think the economist. Well, maybe I want to say a few words on this. I mean, in general, I would say this might be considered as long as it's part of a bigger picture and a bigger solution. And that's what we also wanted to stress in the research we have done collectively in this project. A one-shot solution will not solve problems. It might even make problems worse off. Yeah? And therefore, I would like to come back to the three dimensions we always see in any solution, also transport solutions, that are always needed. It's about infrastructure, it's about pricing schemes, pricing in general, and it's also about regulation. Yeah? And as long as those three are not considered in common, it's probably problematic. Yeah? So if you go for a partial pricing solution, which gives a tariff reduction to a certain solution, and you don't integrate with other modes of transport, also physically, but also from a pricing point of view, with view on externalities, for instance, then most likely the impact will not be that big. And it might even be that the impact overall could be negative. Yeah? You might be attracting more problems than you're solving with this. So I always go back to those three dimensions. It's about infrastructure, it's about pricing, and it's about regulation. I think those three need to be considered in common, otherwise, most likely you have high chance of not ending up with an optimal, a socially optimal solution, even far from that very often. Yeah, that's thank you. Here's another question. I'll hold on to the microphone. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I was wondering, uh, well, people are not born drivers, uh, so I was wondering how uh, the e-hubs can benefit uh, people into turning uh, into, or yeah, prevent people to turning into drivers, uh, as, uh, as, as I think also an important part of, of, of the urban hubs, and if you've done research on that. Thank you. Who would like to respond to that? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I, I think it's a generational thing. I mean, I, I think younger people are more tuned into the shared economy, Airbnb. Um, I think for the older generation, um, private ownership is, is the preferred way of doing it. If we can get younger people uh, seeing the benefit of e-hub and, and shared mobility, um, it will take a lot longer, but you know, in terms of uh, climate change, it's not going to be an overnight change. So for, for the older people, we might need some more regulation, more pricing, uh, short-term measures. In the longer term, you would hope that younger people growing up, we don't have this problem, that they don't fall in love with the car, and they don't want to buy a car as soon as they turn 18, that the problem goes away because we're educating our younger people a different solution. So education will be a solution. No, but we I think it's interesting what Neil's stating because it's, 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 it's not a nature issue, it's a nurture issue. Yeah. Apparently we are not born with a car, yeah. but we are definitely nurtured in a way that we want a car when we're 18. So that's something that we should think about. Yeah. We only have, uh, we're almost at the end of the session, but there are plenty of questions here in the audience and I want to go through all of them. Okay, my name is Ronald Vissers. I live in a municipality called the Hoekse Waard, which basically is an open air museum for public and private transport. If I drive back tonight, it's like a road trip to the 70s of the previous century. I'm an activist, a citizen, and I'm looking for help. How can you help me wake up my elder men, my city council members, the members of the waterschap, which I don't know how that translates, to become active, as active as you are, because I'm here I'm amazed about the discussions. You are light years ahead of my municipality and I think many other municipalities. So how can we do that? Just invite us, maybe. <laughs> just we can arrange over. that. Show or them the results over. of the research that yeah. you've been yeah. doing. I mean, yeah. Yeah, but that, this is the thing. How no, can you definitely. convince people? Because it's also a political issue. Yeah. It is political... Uh, um, well, it's, it's in fashion to be against these things because it takes away freedom. Yeah. I actually invited the, uh, uh, the elder man, and, no, not the elder man, but the uh, uh, public, uh, how do you call it, the, the raadsleden, to councillor, public councillors, to come here. I don't think they're here. Oh, it's that's a pity. Luckily, you can send them the video. So then we go yeah. over yeah. there, so. <laughs> um, more questions? You here? 
Uh, hi there. Uh, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about nodes and network effect. Um, so we do a lot of pilots of hubs, uh, you know, one or two hubs. Uh, often a pilot is, uh, is just kind of an excuse because we don't have enough money to scale something. Uh, but you don't typically build a metro network, uh, sort of one station at a time. Uh, and I wonder sort of what lessons are replicable from these pilot examples as opposed to what the build out of a full mobility hub network would look like in a city. Yeah. Uh, that's a very good question because we are still doing research about that, by the way. Uh, the networking effects, because we are still doing kind of separate pilots, but this requires um, modeling that we are actually doing. At UDELT, we are supervising several master students. I even see one there. Um, we are trying to integrate more these modes into the models that the cities are already using. Amsterdam uses a model. Uh, Rotterdam uses another model. Uh, also, The Hague, the main cities in the Netherlands use models to explain how people move. And we need to be able to integrate these, uh, um, these hubs and then understanding the network effects like you're mentioning and how, you know, you cannot put hubs so close to each other, they're actually cannibalizing the demand from each other, right? So you can only study that if you really w use a, a network model. But for that, you need to be able to explain very well what these hubs represent in uh, supply in these models. And the problem is that they are demand responsive. So if you take a vehicle, this means that you are diminishing the supply of that hub. And this doesn't exist, for example, with cars. We model cars as a flow. It's available, the roads are there, origins, destinations. With the hubs, is different. If you have a lot of usage of a hub, this means that in the next hour, the vehicles are not there anymore. So it's kind of very dynamic. So it's still a challenge of how to, to model these network effects that you are mentioning. We have one more question here. Yeah, I have a question. I work for the city of uh, Arnhem, and the people in Arnhem tell, are telling me uh, to get the people to leave their old car, you have to use subscriptions for electric uh, shared cars and not just a simple app. So that people are more inclined to use the car more often and get rid of their old car. So subscriptions in, in Dutch is abonnement mm. instead of just using an app. What you said is a good thing or a bad thing? It's a good thing to then for, that's what they tell me, to use subscriptions because then people will leave their car. And, and don't use the second car or get rid of their second car. Okay. Quick response from the panel. What is the, the subscription means uh, that so the they have a car always available for them? No, no. <laughs> ah, yeah. I mean, it depends on the econ economics of the... Yeah, I think it depends on, on the business case again. Business I mean, case. there could be settings in which it's better to give people flexibility and not force them to take only that solution or a set of solutions. So it depends again on the type of people living in a certain area. It depends on the size of the city. It depends on the availability of different solutions, modes of transport. There's not a one-shot answer we can give to that. Yeah, Maybe it's a scientific answer <laughs> you don't like, but uh, yeah. it's reality, so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm going to the final question of, uh, of this round. Hi, I'm, uh, my name is Paul Schout. I should hold it. Or, yeah. uh, I work for TomTom, uh, so um, data is really uh, interesting for us. Um, I really like the comment about we actually have to look at behavior, right? Uh, because I can see a hub serving a lot of different purposes. Because you probably have people that are living in a city that have to get out of the city. People don't live in a city, they have to get into the city. But also people live in a city, they want to travel within a city. And I think that is key to understand what kind of hubs and where we need to have them. Do you understand, like, do we have some findings on this as well in the research? Like how many people, how is the distribution basically? I don't think we have this type of results yet because we need more, more experimentation, but you are absolutely right. I mean, sometimes just say, let's put hubs, but okay, what is the function of the hub? And one of the challenges that we have is, is, is to define what the hub is, the typologies of, of hubs, because it can be something like even, even a park and ride, a huge facility on the outskirts of a city, or it can be a small place in a neighborhood that has just a couple of bicycles. Uh, and, a, and just one or two cars. So that is completely different. Is it about first and last mile connectivity or is it about uh, full trips, origin destination in a, in a city? So that's the challenge as well, is to define the different hubs and also understanding which modes work better for the different hubs as well. So uh, with all this piloting and with collecting data, with doing the surveys, we are understanding a bit better what it represents, what are also the, the, the stresses and the anguishes of, of people when they are using these, these apps. But I think we need more research. I don't know if you want to yeah. add more about it. No, no, I think this is, this is indeed the case that we are still in the, in the beginning of this. But, but what I think is very important that we start um, 
recognizing that perhaps it's just a means. It's not a means in itself, it's a means to a, to a goal. So if we're very explicit about what is that we try to solve, then we know that it's, it, that, but that, whether it's a workable means or not. And now what we often see in our studies that it's even worse. It's, 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 it's not a means to a sustainable goal, but it's a means to more congestion or these kinds of things. So that's something really should think about. Luckily, we have uh, one and a half day to talk about this topic <laughs> and to go in depth about this. This is the end of the opening session. I would like a big round of applause, of course, for Gonzalo Gorea from the Technical University of uh, Delft, Rijn-Jan Renes from the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences, Thierry uh, van Elslander from the University of Antwerp, and Neil Volp from the University of Newcastle. Um, <laughs> There are many more opportunities to talk with each other, a quick round through the program for today. So after this session, in about 50 minutes time, so half um, will start with a, uh, uh, with a breakout round. So in this round, we continue with the need for collective mobility and local non-profit sharing schemes here on the second floor in the Grote Zaal. Then on the fifth floor in the IJsaal, it will be lessons learned from pilot cities. Both rounds will have those. So this time, it will be Amsterdam, Kempton and Leuven. The next round will be the mall cities. And of course, in the studio, we'll go for measuring and understanding behavior of shared mobility users on the, the fifth floor is that. And uh, the eHub's blueprint with Bayern will be in the workspace next door. In the expo, one floor down, there is, of course, the, uh, um, the organizations, the suppliers of shared mobility with their presentations there all day. On the foyer, there is possibility of networking. And then, of course, there is an exhibit. Oh, and, um, uh, and we go outside, you can join uh, uh, the wonderful Diederik to go to the Marine Terrain. Uh, the, uh, if you want to, please write your name on the sheet that is at the front desk downstairs near the cafe, so you can uh, uh, ask what well, you can go around with them. Unfortunately, the, for the trip, the field trip to the museum, uh, to, um, to Marine Terrain, there's only a few uh, places available, so be quick to write your name down because if we have everywhere there, there's no possibility to take more people along. See you in a bit, and thank you very much for this morning. Bye. Okay. Thank you.